Now, there was a list that I recently saw, and it shows 120 economies around the world, and it ranked them. And of that, half of that were not countries. They were not economies of countries. They were businesses, you guessed right. And of that, 120, 60 of them were businesses, and businesses today are growing faster than countries. Do you believe that? GDP is growing maybe 5%. China has gone down to 7%. But companies can grow double digit. Some companies double every three years. That's amazing. And we soon see that impact. And it's going to affect all of us. Now, how many of you carry an Apple product, Samsung product? Yeah, almost. My Bible is in here. Some of you wonder, this preacher don't carry Bible. How can? It's not possible for him to preach. But nevertheless, the world of business have changed the way we work. And we need to begin to understand about work. Now, there's one lady who says this. He says, business is the only source of wealth creation in the world. Now, think about that. Business create wealth. Government tax the businesses and create hospitals, education, services for everyone, correct? I'm not saying that government servants are just consuming and consuming wealth, but they are creating value for other services for us. But in reality, business is the only source that brings wealth and the rest are consumers in that sense. But doesn't mean that business is all that important. The rest are also important. Those homemakers, how many homemakers are there in the audience? You work, right? Without you, the children can't go to school. Without you, the husbands cannot dress properly like I today, right? Your shirts won't be ironed. Without you, the diseases will be in your homes. You fall sick. Work brings about value. And today, when we talk about strong businesses, we need to understand work. And we need to go back to the Word of God to understand what work is all about. Now, when we think about businesses, sometimes we think about someone who is wealthy, pompous. Now, if there's any resemblance with anyone, it's just coincidence, huh? I didn't copy somebody's face. We think of someone who may be wealthy, greedy, sometimes corrupt. That's why we try to stay away from business people who are associated with businesses. But in reality, business play a very crucial role for us. And it is indeed, it provides community with goods and services that will enable it to flourish. Every society that has strong businesses will flourish and provide meaningful work, allow us to express our God-given creativity. I recently met someone at a petrol kiosk. You know, a lot of foreigners work for us. And I asked this young man, a bright young man, he looked so intelligent, you know, when I talked to him in English, he spoke perfect English. He says, I'm from Bangladesh. I said, you know, what, what sort of uh, education background you have? He said, I'm a graduate in engineering, automotive engineering. But here he's pumping gas, nothing to do with, well, something to do with car. But hey, a graduate. There are not many jobs around in the country. The GDP of countries are very important. But businesses today has taken over because it's growing so fast and it has become very important. Just now I showed you that lady, Bonnie uh, Wuzbecker. She is the vice president of uh, Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola exists today in 200 nations. It provides 1 million jobs in 200 nations. How many of you have not drank Coca-Cola? You're not in this world if you have not drank Coca-Cola, right? It has impacted the whole world. Coca-Cola, 
I'm not advertising for Coke, okay? I don't drink Coke anymore, by the way, I repented. <laughs> but anyway, it has provided so much employment and it has flourished nations and costs provide jobs. Can you imagine a country without jobs? If you look at nations like Spain, Greece, what is the unemployment rate for those nations? 35, 40%. Someone said 40. I look at the latest statistics, about 35, maybe 37. Malaysian, what is the unemployment rate for Malaysia? 3.5%. Hey, we don't have problem with unemployment, right? There are too many jobs chasing after a limited number of people in this country. Can you imagine if Malaysia have an unemployment rate of 35%, one in three person of you sitting here is without a job, which means uh, every household has to reduce your spending by at least, what, 60%. How would you like that? It cut your cost by 60%. Can you guys survive? How many of you can survive with a 60% cut? No answer. Let's look at Paul's instruction regarding work. This is a very interesting quotation. Let's read all together. For even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. You know, during Paul's time, they live in a very poor environment. You know, if you want to consume something, you've got to give back something. Now, I'm not saying that uh, Paul is not referring to people who cannot work the aged or the handicapped or whoever who can't work. He's saying that if you're not willing to work, then you don't eat lah, or you eat less maybe. In this world, I think we need to learn how to give back. You know, God has given us mandate which we'll talk about afterwards. We need to learn how to give back and recognize that work is something that we give back. There are different views of work, and I uh, struggle with some of this myself. And it's my own journey as I look at myself and as I grew uh, as I became a Christian when I was 18 years old. And I soon grew up in my career. I started as an engineer. I became an MD of a company at the age of 35, uh, 38, sorry. And I grew in my Christian faith, and I struggled with the fact that work is so demanding, and in church, I have to learn how to serve, and serve I did. I was young people leader, I was a deacon, I became an elder, I started preaching, I started uh, doing ministry a lot, and there was a lot on my plate. I was trying to juggle, you know, the topic of a balance. By the way, faith at work, Please come and join us uh, on the 20th Fate of Work. Chiam is going to talk about equilibrium, balance, God at the center. Now, I work with this group of uh, young working adults, and most of them are half my age. Some of them call me uncle. Huh? But they are great people. They are so dedicated, and they want to integrate faith into their work. And that's, those are the, the things that we need to teach our people, that there's no separation. And if we separate work from God, work from our faith, then we find that we can't last very long. The journey is a struggle. And I'll share with you some of the journey that I, a struggle that I have. One of the things we, see, we think about is God is an, uh, work is a necessary evil to survive. We need to work to survive. I mean, there's some truth in it. We need to put bacon on the on the table, right? Somebody has to work. <laughs> when I come back some days very tired, my wife say, oh, you have a long day. Yeah, lah, somebody, somebody has to work, right? A lot of people don't need to work, but somebody has to work in the household, okay? But when I say that, she got very upset. You think I'm not working, huh? huh? Only you working. <laughs> sure, she was working all the time. In fact, more hours than me. So, Sometimes we identify work as you get paid. But work is beyond just getting paid. You don't have to be paid, 
but it is still work. All right? So, work is a career towards success and a good life. So, when I was a young engineer, I was very, uh, what do you call, hyped up. I want to move as fast as I can up the career ladder. And some of us want to do that. And it's, it's okay. It's okay to do that, to grow in your career as fast as you can. Uh, one day, I went up to my boss because I saw the salary of an accountant in my company. And the salary was higher than mine. So I went up to my boss and said, Boss, how can it be? I'm the one that scored the goals for you in your company. This guy keeps score of the goals. How can you pay him more than me? <laughs> I said, it's unfair. You know, I do such things. You know, those days when I was younger, I go up to my boss. I say, I, I, I need to understand this a little bit more. My boss couldn't answer me. He said, go and see the MD. So I went to see the MD. The MD went, go around about way to answer me. He says, the market rate, la, that's how they pay. La. So the long and short of the story is, if you want to grow in your career, don't stay as an engineer. Become a manager. <laughs> that's why I ditched my engineering career and went into management. That's how I moved up in my career. Now I'm not advocating all of you do that, okay? Work is divided into secular work and sacred work. What is sacred and what is sacred? This is something which many of us struggle with. We, 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 we somehow think that if we, certain part of our work on a Sunday maybe is more sacred. When we are talking to someone about the gospel of Jesus Christ at work, maybe it's more sacred. But when I'm doing my job, my project, planning, having a meeting with someone, not so sacred because it's very rowdy. Everybody shout, you know. So sometimes I shout also. But everything is sacred. Do you agree? Everything to God is sacred. There's no divide. Work is an opportunity to do spiritual ministry. Wow. I grew in my career and I grew in my Christian understanding. Oh, God has put me there. Hey, I can do Christian ministry. I can do spiritual ministry. Nothing wrong with that. But is that all? I struggle with all that. So when I was struggling with all that, I went up to see my elder one day, and I asked him, you know, I've been, I've been MD, I'm so busy in my work, and I got to serve in the church. I, I find the whole thing don't connect with my faith. And I'm looking for answers. I look in the Bible sometimes. I cannot see the answers in the Bible. Then my, you know what my elder tell me? He said, Kahui, okay for you lah. Mark time lah in your workplace. When you finish your work one day, come and serve us lah in the church. Be a full-time pastor. Anything wrong with that? Bless him. Nothing wrong with that. I think he has a good heart. And many of us would say that is reasonable. But, you know, for me being me, eh, I find that not satisfying answer. Lah. You know, when you are an engineer, when somebody gives you an answer, we know not so correct one. Eh, we, we, we say okay, lah, but not so good. So I was always looking for that piece of the puzzle. And I was struggling. As I was struggling, I seek out you know, 20 years ago at that time, workplace ministry, marketplace ministry was seldom heard of. Maybe in the West it has started, but in Malaysia and this part of the world, it wasn't heard of. So I began to search and begin to follow through and came across a ministry called FCCI, Fellowship of Companies for Christ International, where business people, I begin to found out that business people can be equally, totally sold out for the kingdom of God. That they can use their business to the extent that they will serve God. And every day in their, ministry, in their workplace, they say, one of them will say that, my workplace is my pulpit. He's preaching from his workplace. 
and he's that CEO of the company, I begin to realize that, hey, there is such a thing as a calling. And there is such a thing where my work can be a calling and God can call me as he has called many pastors in the church, called missionaries, called full-time workers. He can also call me to be in the workplace, to be in the marketplace, to be doing the work that I'm doing. And that's where I begin to connect the two together and realize that, hey, God has a calling for each one of us. Oh no, when I begin to understand that, you know, it becomes clearer. My mind begins to settle more. I begin to accept that, hey, if God has called me, if there is a calling, there must be a caller, right? Correct or not? If somebody is calling you on the phone, there must be a caller. Your phone rings. Don't answer now. Huh? There must be a caller behind that calling. And in the, if there is a caller, there must be a purpose. Hey, what do you want? Huh? You know, when you get a business call, what do you do? First thing is, what do you want? Huh? Opportunity. Huh? Oh, I've got a deal for you. That's what most businessmen like to hear. So there is a purpose when there is a caller, and God is the caller. He has called you to do certain things. He has called you into a certain place, and there is a purpose with that calling. Martin Luther says, as we do the work to which we have been called, we become the hands of God. You become the workmen of God, the feet of God, the mouth of God, the servant of God, wherever God has placed you. Dorothy Sayers, not many of us know her, but she is a contemporary of C.S. Lewis. When I mention C.S. Lewis, everybody knows. But she's as well known as C.S. Lewis. She was a playwright. She was a poet, a Christian uh, writer, novelist. Very well known during her time. He, she says this, if religion doesn't speak to our work life, then it has nothing to say about what we do with the vast majority of time. How could anyone remain interested in a religion that doesn't have any concern with nine, ten of their lives. And I believe that she's right. God is intently interested in our work. I begin to discover that as I search in my journey, there are more than 2,500 verses in the Bible that talks about work, businesses, finance. In fact, there are more verses that talk about work and finances than there are about prayer. I was shocked to find that. So God has actually our work at heart. What is God's view of work? We have covered our own view. What is God's view? Let's read together God's view. In every plant of the field before it was in the earth and every herb of the field before it grew, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. God stopped the rain, didn't want it to rain, because God has a project, and that project is Project Garden of Eden. Many of you uh, who run businesses, you have project, right? But very often, you can't find people for your project. Correct, not? So, the project cannot start. Similarly, God couldn't start this project, so He decided to hold back the rain because it says, there was not a man to till the ground. When a man came about, what did God say? Then the Lord took, God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. So God has in mind for man to work. And you know, the story of the children of Israel in the wilderness, some of you remember that, right? What did they feed on? Manna, every day, they come from heaven, don't have to work, you know? Just sit there and collect money. Or you stand there and open the mouth. Manna fall inside. That's all you need to do. 
And that was what happened. But what happened the day they enter into Canaan? Manna stop. They got to start working. Okay? So what it says in here is that God will provide for us. Yes, in times where there's no way we can work, God can provide. But when we can work, the manna is not going to be there. We got to start working. All right? Let's read this together on the creation mandate, or sometimes it's called the cultural mandate. All right? So let's read together. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. The God created them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. That's creation mandate. And what is it? What does that actually mean? It's an instruction, actually, for every human being, not just Christians, not just believers, every human being. And this was given after God has done His work, finished everything. And He gave this mandate to everyone. Okay? He says, be fruitful and multiply. What does, does that mean? Be fruitful and multiply. It means to procreate. How many of you are married? How many of you have children? All right? Put up your hands. Some. Oh, plenty lah here. We are a very fruitful church. I just became a grandfather. Uh, five months ago. And I asked one of the brothers, before I became one, I asked him, how's it like? Uh? I want to prepare for grandfatherhood, you know? They have to work, you know, being a grandfather. Grandparenting is hard work. <laughs> so we know that parenting and create, procreating is, is not just bringing the baby out and they survive by, by themselves. It's hard work. You've got to bring them up. You've got to train them. And I'm glad that in our church we have ministries for the young right up, right up to teenagers, right up to universities, colleges, and now we are moving into the workplace. The other mandate is to talk about co-create. You know, in Genesis chapter 1, God created heaven and earth. Verse 2, what does it say? Chapter 1, verse 2, what does it say? The earth was void, without formless. The earth was formless and empty. Then God brought form. He brought the earth, the land, the sea, and the sky. And He filled it up with everything that grow on the ground, all the fish in the sea, and everything in the sky. There was no form. He brought form. There was void, empty. He brought fruitfulness. Fill it up. When we continue on with creation, we are not like God. We cannot create something out of nothing, right? But we are co-creators. God has given us the investment, the seed money. You know, in business, we call angel capital. Uh, we put some seed money and hope that the business will flourish. We are to continue with that seed and multiply and grow it. You know, today we talk about the internet. Hey, the internet is something that changes our lifestyle, right? We wake up, first thing we do, read the news on the iPad, right? How many of you do that? <laughs> I read the, my Bible on the iPad. <laughs> Confession, huh? I want to change with the time. I do my work now all digitally. I do my work now without using paper. But for this message, I'm so used to preparing on a piece of paper, I still have to use paper. But nevertheless, we, we find that the internet was a form. But today, 
you know, so many things are transacted through the internet. When it first started, I, I remember it was like maybe 15 years, can't remember, 20 years, 15 years, right? You remember the sound? Ding, 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 ding. What's the sound? Right? When you dial in into the internet, during those, how many of you remember that? Those older ones uh, betray your age. But those days, you only get the fun stuff, nothing, nothing about work, nothing about commerce. But today, it's all serious business. The Googles, the Amazon, and all these are all businesses out there. There was form, and it was filled with all kinds of things. This is part of co-creation. And it also says that you are to replenish the earth, subdue, have dominion over it, say, to take care. To take care of everything that God has given us and also to take charge. Taking care and taking charge are two slightly different things. Taking care says that you are responsible. Taking charge is that you have an authority over this. Some of us are given responsibility, but no authority. As a result, we end up being blamed for everything. We cannot make decisions, right? Some bosses are afraid to give authority, you know. They, they, they're afraid if I give away authority, yeah, I can't take it back, you know. I lose the authority. But do you know that our God gave us authority? In, in the Garden of Eden, authority was given to us and uh, totally given. And we are even given the choice to reject God. Can you imagine that? That is our God who gave us the authority to allow us to even say no to Him. How many bosses do that? We've got to learn how to give away authority. And this is one area that we need to uh, learn as workers out there. You know, people are looking for empowerment. People enjoy it when we are empowered. I remember working for a company for 13 years. I won't mention the name of the company. Today is not so good. Lah. Those days, always rated Fortune 500, top three companies, the best place to work for top three companies, almost every year. I work for this guy. Every morning I get up, I was all hyped up to get to work. I was so happy, so joyful just to get to work. I enjoy my work. And I was given a credit card. As a young engineer, you're given a credit card, corporate credit card. And you know what's the guideline? Most credit card financial controllers say you can spend so much now. You can only spend on this, cannot spend on that. You can do this, do that, but you know. But the guideline given to me on that corporate card was, Kahui, spend it like it's your own money. Use it as if it's necessary. Can you imagine the kind of empowerment you feel? And of course, that didn't last very long because some joker come in and abuse it. He went and checked into a hotel, almost a thousand ringgit, you know in Hong Kong. He said, I couldn't find any hotel, so I checked into this nice hotel, 1,000 ringgit. <laughs> subject to abuse. Authority can be subject to abuse, but nevertheless, do, don't you think God knows that? He knows that. What does it mean? It means the creation mandate is sometimes called a cultural mandate. We are to develop God's creation and not to destroy it. We are to develop it, grow it, Make it more beautiful. You know, work brings about value add. There are two aspects of work. When we do work, one is it creates beauty. The other one, it creates utility. How many of you have been to, uh, if I may ask uh, Datin Enli, uh, toilet? They invited us to their house for lunch. So first time I went to the toilet. I was so amazed by that toilet. There were stained glass, there were seashells, there were small articles, I tell you. And I was told, a child goes in there, don't want to come out. <laughs> there was so much beauty. It was an experience just going into the toilet. It was a work of beauty. Then you ask yourself, what's the use, uh, utility-wise? Uh? You just do your business and come out, right? But work is not just about utility. 
Work is also about beauty. You know, sometimes, I, at one time I sent some roses to my wife. How many of you send roses to your wife? No one? Not even plastic ones? <laughs> wow, I sent her roses. She, she loved it. She was so, wow, at her workplace, everybody crowd around. Wow, who sent you these roses? Huh? Then she says, hey, don't lie. It's so expensive. A few days, it die already. Why you want to send these roses? Don't do it. Buy something else for me. But as far as God is concerned, who created the roses? It was God. Who created the beauty around us? God. So beauty is as important as utility. And I think as human beings, we have lost that aspect of beauty, appreciating the beauty that God has given us in life. All we want is utility. Money, money, money. That is not life. Okay? Be caretakers and not exploiters. Today we see our, our world as, you know, we are suffering from El Nino, right? Getting very hot, 38 degrees. We are to be good stewards and not greedy owners. I had lunch once with a tycoon and we were talking about stewardship. Then he says, yeah, I understand stewardship. Yeah, it's very important. All of us must be good stewards. In my company, I try to be a good steward. So I said, well, stewardship is not just about serving other people. Stewardship is just recognizing that you don't own anything. God owns everything. So I told him, you know, we encourage business owners, not just to tithe your income, but to tithe your business income. Wow, he says, business income must also tithe. Yeah, why not? I've known business people who tithe their business income and some more than 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%. Why not? You're not the owner. God is the owner. They say, what if I don't make profit? Huh? Well, 10% of 0% is zero. Lah. You don't have a tamba from your pocket. But if you're making $1 million, 10% is 100000 Then he told me, Kawi, you can talk like that, lie. you don't own as much as me. <laughs> Back to ownership. I don't own as much as him. So sometimes we understand and yet we don't understand. So it is a subject, you know, the workplace issues. Huh? Sometimes we understand and yet we don't understand because we cannot live it out. But God is merciful. Jesus says, come and learn of me. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Can we make that reality in our life? And when I study the scriptures, I begin to understand if a business person, a workplace person were to come back to the Bible and read the Word of God, it will energize them. It will give them what makes sense for their workplace so that they will live a life that is honoring to God and glorifying to God. Let's read this first together. Ephesians 2 verse 10. We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. God has prepared something for us to do in advance. You know, even before we were born. He knew us. Then He called us and said, Okay, I've got this work for you. Go there. Can we identify with that? Come to the verses for our series on building strong, you know, in Colossians. Let's read together in Colossians chapter 3 verse. I've got it in the Message Bible. Let's read together. Servants, do what you're told by your earthly masters and don't just do the minimum that will get you by. Do your best. Work from the heart of a real master for God confidently that you will get paid in full when you come into your inheritance. Keep in mind always that the ultimate master you're serving is Christ. The southern servant who does shorty work will be held responsible. Being a follower of Jesus Christ doesn't cover up bad work. No excuse, huh? If you do a bad work, shame on you. 
if you're a believer and you do lousy work, bad work out there, shame on you. Because this verse says, no excuse. Doesn't mean that God doesn't want, doesn't say that you have to be the best in your industry. You have to be the best in your work. I know some of us are the best, you know, like for example, our Pastor Key, you know, he rose up to be Director Gener General of a chemistry department. You know, some of us are the best, our company are best in the industry. Praise God. But this verse says, do your best. It didn't say, be the best. Do your best and leave to God the rest. God will take care of the rest. And if you choose to be the best, praise God. Otherwise, our head becomes too big. Huh? And it, it, this is something which a lot of us struggle with. Hey, people are overtaking me. When I was a young engineer, I was telling you, people take overtake me, I cannot take it. I have to overtake them. So some of us may struggle with this. I empathize with you because I walk that journey. I just make more mistakes than you. I'm learning from it that the Bible didn't say that do your, uh, to, to be the best. It says, do your best. And the other part of this verse says that you get paid in full when you come into your inheritance. Now today, young people, working people out there, they keep changing jobs. Changing jobs is a norm, correct or not? After two, three years, the parents will ask, hey, how much are they paying you now? Eh? Oh yeah, 3,000 only. Eh? After two years, only 3,000. Better move, lah. look for another job. Hey, money just the criteria. So if you talk to an average person, five years on the job, at least two different companies. That's a fact of life. I, I understand, you know, sometimes because of the pressure of earning more or getting more, because the cost of living is impossible today. It's really impossible, the cost of living. Especially if you're staying in KL. <laughs> you want to have an easier life, go outside KL <laughs> and go on live stream on DMC. <laughs> Pastor Daniel is here, not here, I can say it like that. <laughs> But instruction here is that you will be paid in full. God is not going to utang you, you know. If the company you work for, you're supposed to get paid 10000 but they only pay you 5000 God recognized that 5000 is held in God's account. You get paid in full with interest or more. How would you like some of you don't believe me, but it's the Word of God. Huh? Hey, uh, it's all the Word of God. It says you get paid in full. Don't have to believe me. Trust in the Word of God. Sullen servant, your attitude. Shoddy work. You know, sullen servant, people who, the Chinese say, mm, come one, you know, you do like, don't feel like doing a, you know, sometimes you ask your kid to do something, throw the cash, the guy will just go, watch the plate, bang, 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 loud, right? Don't feel like doing is an attitude. The right attitude is very important. What does it mean? Working well with your bosses. Doesn't mean that hey, today uh, the, the, the bargaining power has come to the employees. You know? Those days, you've got no choice. Huh? You cannot quit your job. Today, you can just quit your job. But don't take advantage of that situation. Work well with your boss. Okay? Don't just work to please men. When they are looking, then you work. They are not looking, wah, internet, man. Facebook time. Work to the audience of one. God is the one who is watching all the time. When no one is watching, have the right attitude. Have the right attitude towards your work. And work has eternal consequences. Whatever that is not right, you'll be corrected for us. What does every boss look for in an employee? Okay, very interesting, huh? Looks for someone who is dependable. 
looks for someone who is positive, looks for someone who is initiative. Let me try and use the example of my hero. And my greatest hero about a worker comes from the Bible in Genesis where it talks about Joseph. If you remember, actually Joseph had only three jobs. One job was with Potiphar. The other job was in the dungeon where he was sent in because the Potiphar's wife tried to seduce him, but he didn't submit to it and he fell into prison. And the third job was working with Pharaoh. Okay? He was someone that worked with Potiphar. In the Bible, it says that, you know, Potiphar gave everything authority and responsibility to uh, uh, Joseph. And he only need to worry about the food he eat. Everything Joseph will count him. My boss used to tell me this, you know, Kahui, are you worried about the responsibility I give to you? I say, yeah, I think about it. He said, okay, as long as you're worried, I'm not worried. <laughs> Your boss talked to you like that. As long as you're worried, I'm not worried. Wow, oh, that's, he passed all the responsibility. And the same, Joseph was someone who is dependable. Are you a dependable worker where you are? Or your boss have to worry everything. They turn their back on it, something goes wrong. Hey, be a dependable worker. Okay, that's the example of Joseph. Positive. Joseph was sent in prison. And he doesn't deserve it. He was doing a good job. But yet, you know, sometimes we don't deserve things, but we fall into, and some people say it's bad luck. Hey, as believers, we don't believe in bad luck. But in prison, he went into the dungeon. He had a positive attitude. He rose to the top. Can you imagine? In prison, you can rise to the top some more. And after that, he was taken out of prison, promoted to serve the king. And that is being positive. And he was given a second chance because God saw his heart, his attitude. People can see. And many of us, sometimes we suffer a setback in our workplace or business. We cannot recover. We are just lying there in the dungeon, couldn't get out. But God will give us a second chance. He can pick us up from there. I have a friend who runs a business, very successful today. And he always quotes this phrase that God has... He says that God has brought me out of the garbage and put me where I am today. Today, his business is one of the most successful ones in the country, in his industry. The third thing is initiative. We not only need to stay positive and dependable, but initiative. We need to take initiative. You know, usually when we go to bosses, Bosses wants to hear, hey, yala, you got a problem, but what is your suggestion? Nah? No suggestion, boss. Everything, the boss have to give you answers. I work with all business owners, and the business owners and CEOs always complain to me, you know, my people are not like me. Lah. They, they don't treat like it's, it's their own, you know. Of course, lah, it's not their own. You don't make them feel like it's their own. You got to make them feel that they own it. And then they will take initiative. So the relationship with bosses and subordinates goes two ways. And Joseph was asked, when he was asked out of prison to talk to Pharaoh about that dream. Remember that dream? Seven years, there was going to be good harvest. And seven years, there was going to be poverty in the land. So this is what your dream says. Then Joseph says, well, because of that, you need to appoint someone who will look after the welfare and collect all the wealth and all the food and store it up for that seven years of famine that is going to hit the land. And he suggested that to the king with his own initiative. Then the king says, ha, huh, great idea. You go do it. <laughs> How many of your boss always do that? When you give them a suggestion, idea, 
you go do it. So as a result, we dare not suggest, we keep our mouth shut. But then it comes with a promotion. He was taken out of prison, promoted to be the second most powerful man in the whole Egypt. Egypt was the biggest empire, was the strongest nation during that time. And he was the second most powerful man in that nation from a prison pit. God can pick us up from the garbage and put us somewhere special. George Washington Carver. How many of you know this man? Some of us know, yeah. He is the inventor of the peanut butter. We love peanut, all right? Peanut butter. And peanut, he actually has discovered 300 over ways of uh, using the peanut. He came from a slave. He was a slave. And during that time in the South, they were all planting cotton. And you know cotton drains the ground of the minerals such that the ground is no longer fertile. So what George Washington Carver did was he planted, he says you plant peanuts, it will bring back nutrients to the ground and the ground will be fertile again for the next crop. But then nobody, as they plant the peanuts, every day cannot be chewing peanut. So he realized that he must find users for that peanut so that people will grow the peanut. So he discovered more than 300 users of peanuts. And he has this to say. He says, doesn't work. He says that if you do, when we do the common things of life in an uncommon way, we will command the attention of the world. He was asked this question. George, how did you discover so many users of the peanuts? He said, I found it in a book. Can you imagine? He was interviewed by a famous celebrity. I can't remember, it was Henry Ford was that asked him. He says, I found it in a book. He said, what is that book? Oh, did that book also tell you about all the 300 users? All about the users of peanuts? He said, no. That book taught, tell me all about the God that created the peanut. <laughs> and he introduces the Bible. Hey, those of you who are in business and work, we have a book that tells us all about business. The God that created men for business. Okay? So, if business people, workplace people will come back to the Word of God. And after I show you, we have time, a man by the name of Truit Cathy. He has been in business for more than 60, 70 years. Today, he's 93 years old, still running his business. The business is called Chick-fil-A. And he, he said this. He says, biblical principles are no different in business principles. Or business principles are no different than biblical principles. You can apply biblical principles into your business. And he, he, he did that. You know what he did was, he made sure that his workers don't work on Sunday. And then when he was asked to go to a mall, you know all these chicken outlet places, uh, the best place is the mall, right? The mall owner says, hey, Sunday cannot, you must open on Sunday. Sunday we've got the biggest crowd. How can you close on Sunday? So he says, you have to open on Sunday. Then Truitt said to the boss, he says, I open six days because Sunday I want my employees to have opportunity to go to church. If they are believers, I want them to go to church. But if in six days, my gross income for my restaurant is lower than any restaurant in your mall, then I'll choose to quit and I'll carry all the losses. He gave that challenge to the mall owner. The mall owner think about it. It sounded a little bit like the challenge that Daniel gave, right? Eating vegetables. Remember, Daniel and his three friends? Guess what? In six days, his gross was higher than any of the restaurants. Today, he has 1,700 restaurants all over the US. And today, he's still running his businesses. 
using godly principles. Instruction to employers. Let's read this together. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair because you know that you also have a master in heaven. What does it mean? It means to provide your employees with right and fair working conditions and compensation. Provide the right environment to work for your employees and compensation. You know, don't shortchange them. God is the ultimate owner. You are a steward. Recognize that if you're a business owner, recognize that God is the ultimate owner. You are the steward. The business belongs to God. Do you know when uh, I started working among workplace people, business owners, it took business owners at least one year after understanding stewardship to do something about their business, to actually implement something, at least one or two years to do something. Because understanding is one thing, doing it is another. It's really hard. One day, I, I was having lunch with this business owner and he is an elder of a church. He has been in business many years. He contracts with the government jobs and he has been sitting in our meetings for more than a year. One day, he, he told me, Kawi, you know what I did recently? I stopped giving money to one guy who has been giving us contract from the government. I told him, I've decided not to do this, and this is the last payment. He said that. Then he said that it is 30% of my business, and I took that risk. Then he went off thinking that nothing will happen. Then subsequently, this guy called up and said, hey, submit your quotation. He said, oh, still want my quotation? I thought no more already. So he submitted, lah. maybe he just won for the fun of it. So he submitted. Lo and behold, he got a job. He got the job. He couldn't believe it, that he still got the job. And the person who he has been given began to be his great friend because he saw the change in this man. He says, this man is trying to do something right. And maybe I'm the one that's not right. So recognizing that we need to steward our business rightly. God is the owner. If we believe that every part of our work is sacred, then do it right before God. This is one verse which is very interesting. Pay wages on time. Let's read this, Deuteronomy 24, verse 14 to 15. Do not take advantage of a hired man who is poor and needy. Whether he is a brother Israelite or an alien living in one of your towns, pay him his wages each day before sunset because he is poor and is counting on it. Otherwise, he may cry to the Lord against you and you will be guilty of sin. Many Christian business people don't realize this. When they hold back payment, it is a sin. And, and I say that very seriously because we have many Christians who are prominent business owners and don't take heed to the Word of God. I, I shared this with my uh, group uh, of 15 CEOs which I helped to mentor and grow their business. Some of them, a lot of them are not Christians. You know, we are talking about payment, how people, you know, these days delay payment. When times are tough, they tell you they don't want to pay you on time. So I quoted this verse to them. I say that, do you guys know that it's a sin? Some people argue, means, hey, we are just delaying now, we are not paying. But it's, hey, he is not talking about not paying, he's talking about delaying. He says that as the sun goes down, Delay payment. When it's due, you pay. The company that I used to work with, I told you, uh, fantastic company, always number one, number two, number three, top three. My accountant used to call up suppliers, come and collect your check, it's ready. If you don't come, uh, I'm going to send it to you. Please come. They chase after supplier to collect the check because the HQ actually monitor them and say that 
if you cannot manage your cash flow right and have to depend on your supplier to finance you a multinational, hey, something wrong with you. You're not doing your job. Okay? Today, how many businesses do that? That is the Word of God. And if you do it well, your employees will enjoy a better environment to work. Okay? So, we are teaching our business owners to do it right and make a difference. I share this with my business owners. A lot of the non-Christians who are in, in the construction, contracting, he says, wow, if like that, nah, if all property developer pay their contractor on time, all of us contractors will become Christians. <laughs> and if all the contractors pay the suppliers all on time, nah, all the suppliers will become Christians. He said that, I don't know what made him say that, but he said that. It may come true if only we Christians live out this godly principle. It, it will send a strong counter-cultural message to the world that indeed we need to do it right. And it is a sin. It's a strong indictment. You know, the world knows that Ten Commandments is a sin. But many of the Word of God We've we got to take it seriously. You are guilty of sin if you don't do it. I need to move faster. Every employee, what do you look for today? Affirmation, firstly. Secondly, recognition. And lastly, empowerment. Okay? We need uh, to recognize that today in the workplace, a lot of people who are working and they don't really know exactly what they want. In a faith at work ministry, we have people who are in their 30s, and we did a survey among them and says that, how many of you receive biblical guidance for your choice of career? Yes or no? It's a very simple question. And the results wasn't surprising. 75% says that they never receive any biblical guidance. Yeah, they receive some career guidance, but no biblical guidance. And these are among our, our own people. And if you survey outside, among Christians, in our nation or in a part of the world, the biblical guidance towards career choice, somehow we have not done a good job. I, I want to thank, uh, I, I'm very thankful for this church that we have so many ministries, right from a youth, uh, children. My children grew up from this church. In 97, we came here, and our children grew up here. Pastor Key married two of my boys. And they, they grew up, go to university, we have ministries. But when we come to the workplace, somehow, we need to do something. Because a survey was done by Advanta Research, Mike Kinnaman, that says that the age of 18 and 25, the children who grew up in church at the age of 18 and 25, 59% of them left church. 59%. At the age of 18, 25, what happened to them? Something happened? They begin to work. That's my own deduction. What else do they do? They join the workforce. 1825, and there's a crisis of identity. They, they, they need to know what is the purpose. So they need affirmation. If you are a Christian boss, if you are a believer, you got people in your workplace, they don't know what is it that they want. You need to affirm them. You need to tell them this is right. You know, I've got a worker that came to my house recently. We did some work, and he bring an assistant, and this assistant a foreigner. And this boss, huh? Every time the guy do something wrong, why wow, shout at him? No, no, no. Every time it's wrong, boom, 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 boom. Never say anything that is right. You know, I think it's gone upside down. We've got to learn how to affirm that hey, this is the right thing to do and affirm that, yes, you've got to correct them, but you need to learn how to affirm. I tell my business owners and CEOs, I say that before you confront your employee on something they've done wrong. The rule of thumb is four to one. 
You affirm four things. Uh, Pastor Key has said that my wife says good things about me and then say one bad thing. Hey, she's following the principle. So I told my then I said, you, you use a rule of four to one, you won't be wrong. You affirm them four times and then you just gently rebuke them one time. They will receive it. But every time rebuke, 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 huh? hey, numb already, lah. one year in, one year out. So business owners, all your employees look for is affirmation, recognition. They need to be recognized, rewarded. You know, a survey, if I ask you, what is the time where you first, in your working career, where you feel really good, that you're really good about your working career? When is the moment that you feel wonderful, high on cloud nine? When somebody recognize you. For me, it was an incident where I used to work for this great company. Was a great company today, I don't know. My boss came out to me one day, Kawi, shook my hands. Here is a letter from the president of the company congratulating you. And as a result, we are giving you 10 stocks of the company. 10 stocks, of the company, not a lot of money, but it was a recognition that you have been chosen as one of the prize employee in our organization. Wow, that feeling uh, lasted until today. <laughs> I still keep the letter. I don't know for what reason. I still keep it. But your employees look for recognition. You must give them the recognition. Sometimes it's not just about money. Businesses, sometimes you cannot keep giving money. It's the recognition. And the third one is empowerment. Don't be afraid to give away power. Every one of us human beings created by God have that DNA. We want to take charge. So if you take that away, they can never fully work well as a worker. If you recognize how God did that to us in the Garden of Eden, follow that example because we are built with that empowerment capability. So empowerment, I'm not saying that you be reckless by giving them to do, do things that they cannot do, but empower them so that they can do a good job. My time is almost running up. I just want to end with some other, some, a few verses where we read to say that, hey, our work doesn't just get lost here and doesn't count. It counts for eternity because the Word of God says, read together, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of God because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. When I used to read this verse, you know, I always think that it's only about ministry, you know, it's only about if I bring somebody to the Lord, it's not in vain because there's eternal value, the guy's soul is saved, right? I always think of it like that. But actually, this verse, uh, it's more than that. I begin to understand what work is there. I say, this verse says more than that. Your labor in the Lord, whatever you do in the Lord, Lord, our work, God is the master. Everything that you have done is not in vain. You have done the least of this to one, you have done it to me. It's not in vain. It has got, it counts for eternity. Now, this is a more interesting verse which changed my mindset. You know, we, we read about this in 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Let's read together. And now these three remains, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Now, I, I always think that, oh, love, faith, and hope is like something nebulous in the sky. When we go eternity, love is there, hope is there. You know, it will remain. But I don't think that's what this verse means. If you read it in context, it talks about spiritual gifts. If you have prophecy, you have gift of tongues, you do all those things, all those good things, but you don't have these, uh, love is useless. It doesn't count. Then Paul ends by saying that all these three remains. So some theologians have concluded that if our work is done in faith, hope and love, it will remain. Whatever we do, not just work, when we speak in love, in faith and hope, 
whatever actions we do every day. Peggy used to knit, right? She doesn't want me to say this. She knit, right, every day. And she, she, sometimes she knit it for somebody. So I used to teach, tease her. Every stitch that is done in love will last for eternity. Okay? Every single thing that you do in love, in faith, it will last for eternity. The master's commendation, one day, the master is going to say, good and faithful son, you are faithful in a few things, I put you in charge of many things. The joy, come in. Let's watch uh, Kathy Treat. Uh, we have some time very quickly, about three minutes. He's 93 years old. I'm showing this to you all because some of us are a little bit more senior. I, you say, I've done my, my part, okay? But what about grandparenting? What about serving God? Okay, so I, I want you to watch this uh, Caddy Trip. He's 93 years old and he's still actively working. And an amazing man. Uh, let's put the video on. Caddy Trip. And um, he, he has grown his company. Today the son is taking over, but he's still chairman of the company. My name is Troy Cathy, and I, I cook chicken for a living. Troy Cathy, above all things, is a man who's just lived out his life based upon the character of who he is. People ask me about him all the time. People hear that I'm his pastor, and all of a sudden they say, I know Truett, or I met Truett, or he did this. I'm fascinated by everyone talks about the man Truett Cathy. Not the businessman, not the wealthy man. Uh, they are so impressed with his character. He comes from a time period, I think, that is in a Great Depression where they didn't have everything that they needed. And, and it was a cha very challenging time for him. And I think he's now on the other side of that and just seeing uh, how much he's, he's been blessed now and how, how much opportunity there is to give to others in need. I feel like uh, we're created for the purpose of giving. The secret is it's better to give than to receive, and that's something we should believe and some, something we should practice. I think it's very unique to have had such success and not have it change the man, not change his focus, not change his priorities. His priorities have always been the same. He loves God with all of his heart and he was investing his life in other people. He's the same person he's always been, and that's what his greatness is. Money has not changed him. It's just given him opportunities to express himself in a greater capacity. It's incredible to see just the high caliber of people that are just extremely loyal uh, to him and to the, to the business. I go and visit operators in their restaurants, and there's not a day that goes by that people would come up and says, I, you know, I love Truett Cathy. I love what he stands for. I think uh, his, he takes his time, his talents, and his treasures and, and really uh, seeks to give, give them. One of the examples that he's been to our older adults is as long as God has given you life, uh, live it well. You don't, you don't just stop living because you get older. Uh, perhaps when you get older you have more time or more resources. Uh, you have more to give. You have a whole life of uh, wealth of wisdom, if nothing else. And so he's been a great example to our older adults to say, Keep living while you still have life. And I think that's encouraged many of them to keep on going and not stop because you got old. Uh, this is, could be the greatest years of his life. In fact, his most impactful years have been since he's been a senior. And I find when a person do, does the very best in that work, it's fun. When you do something less what you're capable of doing, it's work. We'll never know what we're capable of doing until we start performing at our best. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's Caddy Treat, and uh, he says that money has not changed him. The pastor, Mel Blackaby, son of Henry Blackaby. I had a, a privilege of uh, watching uh, the son, the grandson, 
and they have three generations of pastors. Henry Blackaby is one of the uh, key leaders today that mentor business people. And if some of the pastors want to learn about how to mentor business leaders, Henry Blackaby is one resource area. The last slide I want to show and a story I want to share with you comes from, sorry, I think I clicked too fast. The last verse, can you please flesh out the, the verse we'll read together? Come from a story of Esther. You all know the story of Esther. She was uh, a young girl, eventually became the queen and, uh, of, of uh, what's the nation again? Uh, what's that nation? Huh? Persia. <laughs> yeah, it slipped my mind. I was saying Iran. Persia. And she, she was chosen to be the queen. And she was a, a, a cousin to Mordecai. Mordecai was like a mentor, elder brother. Her parents passed away. And Mordecai sort of raised her, adopted her, and as a mentor. If you want to study about mentoring, uh, Mordecai is a good study. Is, re, let's read this. If you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to royal position for such a time as this. God has placed Esther in the palace. Somehow she became the queen. The king doesn't know that she was a Jew. Mordecai approached her because the whole Jewish race was under threat. Haman was going to kill every Jew. And he said, go appeal with the king. You know, those days, even if you're queen, to appear before the king without being requested is a capital punishment. She risked capital punishment. And Esther chose to respond. She says in, the, in two verses later, he says, please pray and fast. All of you Jews, ask them to all pray and fast for three days. And on the third day, I will go and see the king. And she ended her quotation by the famous saying that says, if I perish, I perish. Stepping out of your comfort zone involves risk. Many of us are in comfort zone where we are. You know, in the Klang Valley, it's very easy to be comfortable, especially when we have made it in business or we have a wealth tucked away somewhere in some properties. We've become very comfortable. It's almost like a palace. But God is challenging us to step out. Step out from our comfort zone where we are. God is asking you to identify with His people. A lot of business people are scared to identify being a Christian. I asked one business leader, and he was in ministry for many years also. I said, you run a business. Why don't you start doing something in your workplace? Apply some biblical principle. You know what was his response to me? He said, Kahui, cannot. If I do that, uh, they all take advantage of me. They climb all over me and they you know, take advantage. You're a Christian, cannot do that. Not true. Not true. I say, I have advised people who are Christians to fire their employees biblically. You can fire people. Uh. He said, yes. You're doing them justice. I fired three employees before. After they went off, they shook my hands. They said, thank you very much, Kahui. I have never experienced this kind of firing before. <laughs> I just tell them, hey, take three months. Look for a job. If you find another job, ask the employer. Ask for my referral. I'll refer. I'll tell them the truth, what you're good at, what you can do, and what you cannot do. Some of them got their job through that. I said, any time you need time off to go for an interview, just call up. I give you time off. You take the day off. Wow, how many bosses do that? You can fire people biblically and you're doing justice to them. You're helping them to find a calling for their life. Okay? 
So, God wants you to step out of your comfort zone and meet a specific need. Esther saved the nation of Israel, uh, the whole entire Jewish race, by doing that. And if you want to do something great for God, you cannot be moving around, running from one place to another. Rolling stone, gather no moss. Stay put. Sometimes you may be taken advantage of. Do you know another hero of mine, the book of Daniel? Daniel outlasted, he worked for how many kings? Huh? Five kings. He outlasted four of his bosses. How many of you outlast your boss? Never. The boss will make sure you leave first. But he outlasted four of his bosses. We remember Daniel today. If you don't do something significant, sometimes you have to stay put. But of course, there are times where you may need to make a move. But ask God. Make sure you ask God before you move. So I want us to just think about how to step up and meet a specific need. How to make some shift and changes in our workplace. A significant shift. One person I had lunch with recently, he backslided, came back to the Lord recently, runs a public listed company. And he says that those days I contract deals, I have people, associations, I have people whom I know who can influence the deal. Today, I don't do that. There are a lot of things I don't do in my business. But I do one thing. Before I go for a meeting, before I submit a tender, I pray. I pray to God. Hey, that's the highest influence and connection you can have. You don't need all the rest of the connection. You've got God. And I congratulate this brother. He's making that shift. And all of us can do that. 